Today is January 20th, 2024. But for many, probably most Israelis, it is still October 8th, 2023. It is the day after Hamas drove into Israel in pickup trucks and on motorcycles and flew in on hang gliders, murdered over 1,200 Israelis, kidnapped 240 seniors, adults, children, and babies, maimed and raped countless Israelis, and destroyed people's homes and communities. It is the day after the government, which staked its reputation, its legitimacy on security, and Israel's vaunted army failed miserably to protect the citizens of the state of Israel, and normal Israelis had to fend for themselves and each other if they wanted to survive. And it is the day that Israelis saw how many parts of the world either just shrugged or said, it's your fault, you deserve this. This was the opening message that journalist Chaviv Retig Gore shared with a group of 17 rabbis from the United States on January 2nd. This group, which I was privileged to be part of, was on a solidarity commission, mission with the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition. There are a lot of Jewish groups out there with acronyms, so the ZRC is a newer group that was created by Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt of Potomac, Maryland, to counter the idea that had become prevalent that American Jews, particularly rabbinic leadership, particularly younger rabbis, had used their disagreements with Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing government as a pretext to pull away from support of Israel. The group included rabbis of all denominations and of those that considered themselves just Jewish and came from communities like Charlotte, New York, Austin, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and other cities across the United States. All of us had been to Israel before on vacations or synagogue trips, but this time we went to witness the atrocities that had been committed by Hamas on October 7th, so that we could better teach our communities what had happened. We went to hear the testimony of survivors, and of those who had tragically lost loved ones. And we went to tell Israelis that they should not feel as alone in this war. The trip opened with a two-hour discussion with Chaviv Retig Gore from the Times of Israel, who gave us an overview of the politics of the situation and the feelings running through Israel at that time. He talked about Hamas as one of several regional proxies for Iran, and the widespread belief that the war with Hamas was just the first smaller war before an eventual confrontation with Iran. And he talked, unfortunately, about the length of time that Israel would likely be tied up in Gaza in some form. He talked about the feelings of absolute betrayal that many Israelis feel toward their leaders who ignored reports of Hamas's planning and were completely unprepared for the attacks of October 7th. He predicted that a major political shakeup is coming and that Bibi Netanyahu is essentially finished as prime minister. Take that with a caveat, it's a prediction. He shared that after its initial failure, Israelis feel that the army has taken ownership of its mistakes and they have great faith in military leaders like Yoav Gallant and Gadi Eisenkot to execute this war. But despite all this, he also shared the incredible feeling that Israelis have put aside their very intense political differences and rallied around the idea that Hamas can in no form be allowed to keep power in Gaza. The faces of the hostages, the Khatufim, are everywhere, and Kfir Bibas, the boy who should have just celebrated his first birthday two days ago, is probably the most well-known baby in the country. Over the following three days, we saw Khaviv's descriptions play out with all of the people we met. The most difficult portion of the trip was a visit to Kibbutz Kfar Aza, a kibbutz that has been located five kilometers from Gaza since 1951. Today, the kibbutz is an empty and a destroyed battlefield, but we met there with Elon, 
a man whose family had been there for four generations and founding members of the kibbutz, and with a commanding officer from a local regional battalion. The two men took us through the kibbutz and explained what happened at that, on that day. They showed us the fence of the kibbutz, and you can see from there a clear view of Gaza, right on the other side of an open field. On October 7th, Hamas motorcycles drove across the field and broke through the gate. And the road, the road right inside the fence is made up of smaller houses, where young adults in their 20s lived. All of the houses are damaged in some way, if they are standing at all, and most of them have banners with the faces of the kibbutz residents who were either murdered or taken hostage. They showed us the armory where the kibbutz's weaponry was stored. Early in the invasion, Hamas set up snipers who took out every member of the local guard that got near the armory. And they shared the chilling fact that Hamas came in knowing every single detail of where, what happened on this kibbutz and where everything was. Because like all of the communities in the area, Kfar Aza would bring in Palestinians from Gaza to work every day in jobs that were in very high demand. But that on the terrorists who were there after the fact were found maps and detailed descriptions of the kibbutz that seemed to have been drawn by people who were there every single day and brought back reports to Hamas. Elon, the man whose family had founded the kibbutz, shared that that morning he was sleeping in one of his daughter's rooms while another daughter was at a sleepover on the other side of the kibbutz. He heard rocket, science, rocket sirens and at first stayed in bed because hearing rocket sirens is normal there. Then he started getting texts from the neighbors where his daughter was staying on the other side of the kibbutz. Send help, there are terrorists here. The texts kept coming throughout the day because it took 11 hours for any soldiers to get to Kfar Aza. Too many residents learned that their bomb shelters that they rely on to keep them safe from missiles falling from above were almost useless in protecting them from fighters who wanted to come through the front door. Miraculously, Elon's family survived, but over and over again, he screamed at the soldier, at the commander with us, where were you? The dialogue between Elon and this high-ranking military official was not planned, and it demonstrated the anger in Israeli society that exists under that sense of unity and determination to fight Hamas. One of the rabbis asked Elon if he would come back to Kfar Aza when they're ready to rebuild. And he said quickly, no, how can I possibly bring my children back to this place? A little later, the commander told us that he was fighting so that Israelis would come back to this region, a region that I should point out is part of Israel proper and is in no way contested territory. Elon, listening to this, took offense and snapped at the soldier and said, I am not interested in coming back here so that you can plant a flag, so that you can redeem your honor, your dignity in this. The soldier replied, I didn't say a flag. I want you back here, reflecting the idea that so many in the military generally feel a responsibility to the people of Israel. Now, although the anger was there, there was also an intense appreciation for the everyday normal people who stepped up as heroes to save and support their neighbors. Last night, I spoke about two heroes who survived that day and what they have done. But today, I want to share the story of one hero who did not. And his name was Aner Shapiro. And we had dinner with his parents, Moshe and Shira, in Jerusalem. Aner was 22 years old and an interesting family history. His great-grandfather had been Chaim Moshe Shapira, one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence. His parents were both accomplished architects and seemed to be typical, more traditional Jews. Aner was the oldest of seven children and served, served in the Nachal Brigade and enjoyed writing his own music, his own melodies to traditional Jewish texts. His parents shared that Erev Simchat Torah, Erev Shabbat, the last day of the holidays, the night before the attack, 
had been the first time during that holiday season of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and all the days of Sukkot that the whole family, that all of their children had been together and that they had blessed their seven children on that night. Aner, being a little less traditional than his, fam than his family, had left after dinner to go to the Nova Music Festival, a, a, a place, a festival that really des deserves its own story, its own, uh, its own sermon. Later on, witnesses and a security video showed his parents the final moments of Aner's life. His father, Moshe, clearly a man of deep faith, referred to this video uh, using the term a chesed shel emet, a strange term to use, an act of kindness, the, the, the description we usually use of a burial. He described having this video as an act of kindness because it showed him how his son had spent his last few moments and how his son had died. Although Aner was off duty, he took charge when terrorists invaded the festival. He brought other festival goers into the bomb shelter and started to organize the more physically able uh, to fight if Hamas came through the door. But instead of coming in, the terrorists started lobbing grenades in. So Aner, as the video shows, started grabbing the live grenades and throwing them back out. Seven times he did this, but the eighth grenade exploded and killed him. Some of the people in the shelter who were with him were taken as hostages, and some survived. A few of the rabbis, as we're listening to this story, wondered, why are we asking these grieving parents to tell this story? Why are they telling this story over and over again? They told us they'd spoken to three groups that week. But it was clear that they took comfort in sharing the way that Aner's life had ended. It's important to recognize that people grieve in different ways. Some of the parents of children at this festival have pulled in, withdrawn onto themselves, and need that quiet to be left alone. Others, like Aner's parents, want to share that story so that people know what happened. They played for us a recording of him singing his melody for Im Eshkachech Yerushalayim, If I Forget You, Jerusalem. And when they finished their story, we sat in silence. Because how do you respond to hearing a story like that? One rabbi stood up and said, thank you for telling Aner's story. We will share it so that others know who your son was. I'm sharing these dark stories with you today because October 7th, 2023 is a moment that will be taught in Jewish history in the future. I'm also sharing these stories because, as we know, this week, Israel as a country stands accused of committing genocide, the intentional attempt to destroy an ethnic group or religion. And the hypocrisy of a country making this claim in the International Criminal Court of Justice, while it ignores something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a deliberate attempt to wipe out another country, is astounding. There is no doubt that the deaths of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza is absolutely tragic, is a terrible thing. It is the death of the firstborn that we read about today, times a thousand. And the same questions that we ask and should feel about the story that we read in the Torah, we should definitely feel about the death of so many Palestinians in Gaza. But, and there's a big but on this, the termination of genocide depends on the intent of the actions being judged. When you see what happened on October 7th in Israel and hear Hamas's boast that it would do this again and again, you know that even if they may not have the actual ability to be an existential threat to Israel, you see what the intention to wipe out a people, to wipe out our people is. It is fair to judge Israel's actions in war only in the context of accepting that it is a defensive war and that Israel is acting to protect its citizens from a hostile neighbor that has demonstrated its willingness to murder men, women, and children in the cruelest ways. And throughout the trip, all of the rabbis asked that same question that so many American Jews have asked. What do we do? 
what can I do to help in this? And so many people have found different ways to help. It's a community. We've supported different organizations. Interestingly enough, we met with uh, the director of trauma at the Barzilai Medical Center, which received many of the, the, uh, the victims on October 7th, although he was stuck in his house uh, that day because his community was invaded. And uh, he, made the, he made the somewhat humorous comment that he wished American doctors would stop calling him, asking if they could come to his hospital. But uh, it's hard to know exactly what to do. But I think what I learned in this trip is I know that my job continues to be, and for so many of us, our job will continue to tell the stories of what happened on, Jan on October 7th, 2023. Because for all of us, it's mid-January, then February, then March of 2024. But while Hamas maintains power in Gaza, for Israel and for Israelis who are under threat from them, it will always be that day of October 8th, 2023. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>